Hi, I'm Erin of Love and Works Media, and I wanted to give a quick introduction to the podcast. Currently, I am in the least soundproof of conditions, and neither am I using a decent mic, and I apologize. I haven't figured out if I should keep doing this weekly or bi-weekly. I'll have an update for you when I can. In the meantime, please enjoy this sci-fi narrative podcast. He is a man of no stories, a man with no words to describe or to woo him, a man who speaks not and hears not. He is a man of nothing, a king of silence, and yet he is amongst the most amazing men in the universe. He walked down a hall briskly and with the bounds of a man long used to the slightly lesser gravity of a nice spacecraft light years away from his home. Though his bounce was that of a man of experience, his gait was that of a man not being watched. He threw himself forward at times and bounced up with his hands or sometimes ran until he had enough momentum to run on the walls on all fours until he inevitably fell gently to the floor. He, on this day, had gotten a running start to jump high enough to touch the cold metal ceiling of the spacecraft hallway. He kept momentum in a jog forward until he hopped into a ladder, which he climbed like a dog running flat. Once up the tube, he was out in the open. He strut down the vast room furnished with smooth metal benches and long tables meant to house hundreds of people that simply did not exist. He continued as he had thousands of times and got his morning coffee. At least, he called it his morning coffee. In space, so far from Earth he couldn't communicate with it, he had no way of knowing the time, or the year. He had forgotten what time was, what days were, what an hour meant, what the structure of an eight-hour day had been like. By Earth hours, his last coffee had been nearly three days ago, but with no sun or rotating light system on the ship, the man thought it to have only been a few hours. He cursed himself for being so addicted he needed it so often. He hadn't even slept since the last cup. He approached a bright white box and sighed as he waited a moment. Soon, he could smell coffee freshly brewed in cinnamon and a soy-based vanilla cream topped off with just a dash of nutmeg. He used to hate the taste of soy, but it had been years since he had tasted meat or animal product. He forgot to hate the plants he used to rarely eat. He opened the front translucent doors and grabbed the cup that was already beginning to deteriorate in his hands. He stood and chugged the coffee before the cup could spring a leak and didn't care that he was spilling the hot beverage all over his bare chest. He didn't care when he realized he hadn't put on pants yet and yelped when a drop hit a more unpleasant place. In his shock, he dropped the coffee and madly scrambled backwards as it splashed about on his legs and bare feet. He gave a low, frustrated growl as he stood over the mess trying to determine if he needed to clean it up or kill himself so he wouldn't have to. Knowing he was overreacting, he unhappily walked back to the tube and climbed down to the hall and to his bedroom to continue to the unattached bathroom. There were many bigger, better bathrooms on the ship, but he had grown attached to the one by his bed. He got into the shower and the water turned on by itself to its desired temperature that had steamed up the room. He stood under the stream for a moment before shaking his head so his thick dread splashed their collected water about the room. A little while later, he soaked an unconscionable amount of shampoo into his hair before sitting under the water for even a more unconscionable amount of time. When he finished, he tied a jacket around his waist to protect himself from the same mistake he had made before without being bothered to dry off and dress. He headed up to the common room and looked down at the mistake on the floor. The cup was riddled with holes of rot as it desperately tried to revert back to the dead leaves it had been hastily weaved from the moment his presence at the coffee machine had been detected. The man had never seen the plants that had made so many functions on the ship possible. He had perfected the automation of all the renewable resources in human space travel before its current ship had been built. Hundreds of miles away but approaching quickly was a second ship, intrigued by the existence of the first. Commander Dick, a man completely aware of his unfortunate name in English, stood in front of a screen showing a rather low-definition image of the ship he was approaching. He pressed a button. Captain, should I fire a flare? It's a human ship, the captain warned in her usual caution. The last thing we need is for a human to think we're firing at them. They 
merchant ship, but it's just floating, the commander noted. It's just coasting out in the open. It could be bandits trying to lure a merchant that might think someone on board needs help. Does it appear armed? Dick double and triple checked the image before he gave the answer he already knew. I don't have a clear image, but there is nothing obvious. If it is a bandit ship, then they would have had hostile equipment hidden from this distance. Dick sighed. Humans don't coast this far from their system. It has to be a ship captured by bandits. Better we engage it than a good meeting merchant. Fire the flare, Commander. Commander Dick put one of his three-pronged hands on the dial to control which image appeared on the screen. A second hand on the flare launch button, and the remaining two on the controls. He fired the flare and waited for the bright, blinking device to get close before switching to the main center of the device. A camera. As the flare neared, he attempted to send a signal to the ship which, to his surprise, went unanswered. Usually in an ambush, somebody answered and called for help. He searched and searched, but he saw no seams in the metal that would suggest weaponry. Nothing visual. Checking density. He fired from the flare two thin lines with a hook at the end that hooked at the shell of the foreign ship. Through the wire, he sent two bursts of sound that would alert anyone inside that they were being checked out by a deranged bump noise specific to a non-hostile flare. He switched the dial and the screen showed a rough blueprint of the ship. It does not appear to be armed, but it also does not appear to be carrying cargo. I don't see any signs of life either. The ship is either abandoned and just drifted far from home, or it has some very tricky bandits in it. Either way, we can get a good price for scrapping it. Engage. The commander stood up to abandon his visual station to approach engineers at the bridge. Approach the ship with weapons drawn. We're going to connect with it and check it out. The engineers took the order and ran with it to hop the ship forward with needle-thin precision. Knowing the chance of it being a trap was low, Dick walked nonchalantly to the connection port with only having gestures for two barely armed guards to travel with him. At the connection port, the captain ran up to him holding a long rifle. I know it's nothing to Dick, but you should be more careful, the captain scolded. Go now. Dick gave a little bow before continuing with a gun that did not match his unarmored outfit. He approached the door and waited for it to whoosh. The air inside the new ship was fresh and their door was left unlocked. Odd for an abandoned ship, but not unheard of. A ship left in a big enough hurry would have its functions left on until the automations broke down. With zero expectation of encountering life, the commander continued down the hall. It wasn't too dirty, but it had certainly been used since it was last clean. The ship did not have the tall tale, horrible smell of an abandoned ship. Commander Dick came slightly paranoid of encountering something, alive or dead. He followed the hall to a narrow ladder. He took it down to a common room where he saw a naked human man. Big and burly. The human could crush the commander if he wanted to with his bare hands, and it didn't help that he was showing off his able thick body and the fact that his only cover was a dirty, cheap janitor's jacket far too small for him tied around his waist. From the back, the view Dick had, he could still see the parts humans tended to cover and was a little confused as to what the point of the jacket was. The room smelled of fresh coffee, soy, vanilla, and cinnamon, all plants Dick had only smelled in passing. The human looked behind him to see the aliens, but then looked away as though he hadn't seen a thing. Stay close, Dick warned the guards as he pointed his gun and carefully approached. Human, can you speak English? He asked. The human did not acknowledge the words. Are you alone? The human grabbed his coffee from the little white box and sat down at one of the hundreds of available seats. He leisurely sipped as he stared at the crew. He didn't look curious. He didn't look angry. He didn't even look confused. He simply looked. He could be hostile. Dick slowly walked forward and tapped the shoulder of the human with one of his two hands unencumbered by the weapon. The human's expression shifted from a blank stare to one with a hint of oddity. 
He reached up and gently held a hand that had touched him in one of his as he inspected the exoskeleton of the commander. What happened to your crew? the commander asked. The human didn't seem to hear him. He felt at the join of one of the commander's three fingers as if trying to figure out how they move. The commander reached for his radio. Captain, we found a human aboard. We're not sure if he's alone. Is he hostile? the captain asked. Dick looked down at the gun the human was failing to react to. I don't think so. He's mature, but he appears to have the brain of a child. The human let out a rough puff of air, nearly resembling a laugh. I have no idea if he can understand me. I'll send a second crew down the scout. You three stay with the human. The commander stood in silence for a while as he watched the coffee cup break down. What was the point of a single-use plant fiber cup? Why not get a glass cup and just wash it like a sensible alien? He noticed the human closing his eyes and his breath slowing. Captain, I think the human may be exhausted. I can't tell much with him, but it would explain his lack of reaction to us. If he's safe enough, we'll send a doctor for him. Right now, I have marines looking for other members or bodies. We're going to send a sound scouting device. Understood. After a few moments, Dick heard the tall tail thumb signifying an object much bigger than his flare had attached to the ship and was gathering higher definition data. Ship is no doubt a merchant ship, the captain relayed over the radio. Contains a small, locked armory, but it's empty. Cargo bay is empty. The ship has a medical bay, but many of the automations do not appear operational and there's no staff. All movement except for four bodies in the common room appear to be automations. That's us, Dick confirmed. The human looked away to chug the rest of his coffee before standing up. He stretched his arms above his head and his size intimidated Dick. Being very tall for a Crawlian, he was entirely unused to being towered over, so for the human to stand a full two feet over the commander put him at a great unease. The human put his arms back down and showed curiosity as if he hadn't noticed the aliens before. He stepped forward to lean down so his face was uncomfortably close to the commander's. He grinned to show his large, crushing teeth to the little bug-like alien. With a sinister, growing laugh, he grabbed Dick and hugged him tightly before letting him go and sprinting to the food box. He ripped the door open and pulled out one of the many food items that had collected in the three days he had forgotten to eat. He exclaimed in a loud, barbaric shout in excitement as he grabbed condensed food bar after condensed food bar to run back and offer to his guests. He waved to them at the Crawlians. Could we even eat human plants? A guard asked. The commander slowly accepted one of the bars and bit into it. It was not made for his fragile exoskeleton teeth, and it was rough as his body was not designed for food that required chewing. He chewed some of the dry dust but continued to eat the gift regardless. The human looked on intensely. After choking at least three times eating the bar, Dick broke the awkward silence by clicking on his radio. Captain. He either tried to communicate diplomacy or he's completely insane. Uh, any news on the second party? The ship is designed for hundreds, but there's only enough furniture for one human. Bacteria growth is out of hand and the place hasn't had a full crew for years. Hmm. You were here all alone. Dick realized as he looked up at the overjoyed man in front of him. I've heard of humans getting space madness on solo missions, but why is he so far from Earth on a ship that shouldn't have left this system? Dick hesitated before speaking back into the radio. Captain, what's the diplomacy rules of finding a distressed human? There are none. The man sprinted down to the white box and waited excitedly as the smell of more exotic earthly scents filled the room. He grabbed the cup and tried to hand it to the commander. Crawlians can't have coffee, human, Dick informed him. After, he realized the smell wasn't of coffee like the previous cup from the white box, but of a similar plant originating from Dick's home planet. Huh. He took a sip and found it neither good nor bad. He never drank soy before, and he thought it conflicted with the main liquid. Commander? They picked up the radio. Captain? 
I'm not gonna let a human with space madness on my ship. But if you don't think he's a threat, we can leave him and call his secondary ship to pick him up. I I think that's best, Dick agreed. We're far from diplomats. Besides, if he's here from an act of war, he might not be too fond of us when it comes to... Dick patted the human on the shoulder. We'll get a team more equipped for you. The human did not respond. He just kept his big grin. Dick was a man who had seen pleading eyes so many times in his career that he could no longer recognize them. He turned and left without further word, followed by his guards. And a human. Of course, Dick muttered. He turned sharply. Human, you can't come with us. It's a warship. It's a conflict of interest to have a human aboard. The human ran up and grabbed the commander's shirt collar. Not the tug, just to hold on to. Go. Get you. Put on some clothes. The human stayed. Dick gently slapped the human's hand, and the human retracted it, looking offended. When the aliens continued their walk to the port, the human still followed, but at a greater distance. Dick knew the engineers on the bridge would react. As soon as all Kralians crossed the threshold of the port, the port shut tight to lock the human on the other side. That was interesting. Dick remarked to his crew. Nice little distraction from the task at hand. Uh, but never mind that. Crashes rung through the port. The human was beating on the side of the door and hard, but all the bones in his body would turn to dust before the metal would give. Uh, the captain was right. It's best he's not on here. As Dick took his usual seat from where he could overlook the radar, he noticed that the merchant ship was trying to follow. Its little thrusters could barely move it to the speed of light, and it was obvious from the radar that the ship was not running correctly from its lack of proper crew. Dick was so preoccupied from being amused at the little ship's heart, he nearly didn't notice a flicker on the radar. Captain. Object detected. It's using a cloaking device, likely. With 3.2 gradients negative, 42 degrees off center. Arming shields. Fire on sight. If it were a friend, it'd make itself visual, the captain warned. Turrets on auto-aim. Firing lines out to see if it connects with anything. The commander watched on his radar as the image rapidly blacked out where the lines were making no contact. There was a thump. Not the annoying thump of a scouting device using sound to map a ship, but the crash of metal shooting through metal. The sound of screams of brief movement when anything not nailed down attempted to escape to the vacuum space before the ship repaired itself to hug the foreign tubes lodged into it. Alarms began to blare as the commander scrambled to turn his dial to a map of its own ship. It was being overrun by soldiers coming through the tubes. From cameras, Dick could see the soldiers were pouring in and spraying a green mist that wasn't settling anytime soon. By the sight of Kralian stiffening and dropping at exposure, he knew it was a poison that specifically and near instantly dissolved the pieces of plating that allowed joint movement and would go on to slowly dissolve the exoskeleton of its immobile victims. Gas suits. Do not send soldiers without gas suits, Dick pleaded over the radio. He watched near helplessly as the foreign soldiers ran through the ship, spraying the poison wall followed by heavily armed guards ready to take down anyone in a suit. As the remaining soldiers were suiting up, the intruders were quickly advancing with the knowledge that they were on borrowed time. In the corner of all the visual information he called to the screen, screaming over all the orders he barked into radios, he saw on the radar a slow-moving merchant ship approach the then-cloaked enemy ship and latch into its port. What in the vastness of our world is that human doing? Dick asked himself. In an instance, in his small moment of dropped guard, the door to his office was shocked until it opened and a small alien pointed his prayer at him. And before he could react, he was stiff, unable to blink, barely able to breathe. The poison stung like hell of a million wars on its exoskeleton as it began to melt it. As he lay dying and unable to do his job, as he was utterly helpless, he thought about the human the odd little man he had encountered. He was glad to have had that interaction before meeting his inevitable demise in a battle, to have tasted soy. 
the human? Why was he at the gate of an enemy ship? Thank you.